The views expressed in these posts are those of the presenters and are current only through the date stated. These views are subject to change at any time based upon market or other conditions, and Eats in Advance disclaims any responsibility to update such views. This material is a general communication which is not impartial and all of the information provided has been prepared solely for informational and educational purposes and does not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security or to adopt any specific investment strategy. MSIM, the Asset Management Division of Morgan Stanley and its affiliates have arrangements in place to market each other's products and services. Each MSIM affiliate is regulated as appropriate in the jurisdiction it operates. MSIM affiliates are Eaton Vance Management International Limited, Eaton Vance Advisors International Ltd, Calvert Research and Management, Eaton Vance Management, Parametric Portfolio Associates LLC, and Atlanta Capital Management LLC. Welcome to the Rainmaker Podcast with your host, Guy Costin. The goal of this podcast is to give listeners a unique look into sales strategies from top industry executives. We introduce you to the heads of sales and heads of distribution who will help you understand the inner workings of the successful sales organizations from philosophy to execution. This podcast is essential for sales professionals seeking wisdom from the best in the field. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Rainmaker content, please check out dakota.com to learn more about their services. This episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace, the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases, websites, form ADVs, and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakota.com forward slash Dakota hyphen marketplace today. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rainmaker podcast. Guy Costin, founder and CEO of Dakota. I'm joined by Matt Whitkos, managing director at Eaton Vance. Matt, welcome. Thrilled to have you here. Glad to be here, Guy. Looking forward to it. And we'll kick it right in. Can you just give us, Matt, some background right from the beginning after college? Because pretty darn fascinating. Sure. Well, uh, I don't know how fascinating it's going to be, but uh, <laughs> right out of school, started at Putnam as an internal wholesaler. So really got on the phones uh, in 1989 okay. and uh, took a trip to California, decided that it was calling. So I actually left Putnam a year later and became an external wholesaler for Nuveen. Oh, wow. And it's not the Nuveen you know today. This is Nuveen that was UITs and mutual funds. Okay. So I moved to San Francisco uh, and that's when I learned to wholesale. So without Waze and without your cell phone, you're figuring out how do you crisscross that state? Well, it was a lot of fun. From there, I ended up at uh, GE. So Matt, let me just ask you a question because sure. part of what we talk about a lot is hiring young men and women, but getting them slotted into the right sales processes right out of the gate. So it sounds like both with Putnam and Nuveen, those principles you learn very young, like sort of set a foundation and a, and a true sort of direction for your sales career. You want to comment on that a little bit? Sure. So, you know, uh, if you're an internal wholesaler and you're listening, if you have a great external, they're, they're educating you every day about how to do the job and you're helping them be more effective and efficient at their job. Going to Naveen, no one had been in the territory. So literally it was just a list of names and, and that's where you really learn how to call and get meetings. I think the thing you learn the first thing when you're wholesaling, when you're in the field is how effectively to schedule meetings so you're not crisscrossing and driving. How do you maximize your time in the cities or the firms you're going to see? And that you don't, that's not taught. You just only know by getting there and doing it. Right. How much of your sales team, because I'm a big cold outreach, cold email, finding new investors that you've never spoken before. How much is that an e a part of the ethos of how you ran, have you been running things at Eaton Vance and then into Morgan Stanley? Well, it's a big part of it. Uh, I have a simple methodology. The way we like to think about our business is the top advisor, multiple, multiple products. And what I mean by that is how do you define a top advisor? Uh, our definition would be the industry defines a top advisor or their firm does by the type of clients they serve. And so uh, how do we use our sales capacity? Gee is really key because yeah. we're a large firm. 
We have a lot of products. And one of the most precious things a sales manager can have is sales capacity. And where do you spend it? So the key is what you're getting at there is um, how are you allocating the salesperson's time? And when you talk about, and so finding those top advisors, if you don't have a relationship, just doing the cold outreach. But who are you talking to, right? right. Like you don't want to keep going down a list until you get a yes and right. then a meeting. <laughs> I, yeah. I think what you want to know is who do you want as a client, right? right. And that's, that's really who you have to spend your time calling. It isn't someone that just maybe, as we say in the industry, dropped you a ticket and yeah. you want us to come and see that individual and say hello. Well, you do that 10 times over and you're in a totally different zip code. Right. Your business does. And I think that's one of the things we really bring as a discipline to say, just really simply, top advisors, multiple products, and then we help them define who a top advisor might be. Brilliant in terms of how you repeat the strategy, because that's a key part of business is knowing what your strategy is. And you just articulated there. It sounds like in our pre sort of pre conversations, you learned a lot of some of these principles at GE right after Naveen. Yeah, I know it's a little strange to be talking about General Electric. I know we think about light bulbs, appliances, and it's it's not the behemoth it once was. But GE uh, had one of the largest pension plans when I started working there. They wanted to get in the mutual fund business. I actually talked about buying other firms when I was there that are all recognizable names today. Well, that didn't work out. Uh, they basically ended up selling Kidder Peabody, which was a broker dealer, to Payne Weber. Why that was important to me is, well, they made me do all this training. So I had, we took GE's management program. I became a black belt in Six Sigma, which is just basically measuring processes. Uh, wasn't near where my major was in college at all. So when I got out of GE, I kind of really started understanding how to use all these tools that I never thought I'd see in the investment business. They totally work in sales management. That's great. Then when you, so GE to Eden Vance, is that? It was GE to Natixis. So I went to Natixis, uh, where I was global head of sales working for John Heiler oh, yeah. uh, at, uh, at Natixis and yeah. was there for seven years. And okay. then I ended up joining Eaton Vance from Natixis. What year did you join Eaton Vance? 2007, gotcha. just before the financial crisis. <laughs> well, uh, that's great. I, I like John a lot. Um, so walk us through your, your days at Eaton Vance, because clearly phenomenal firm, great culture. There's a lot of, I mean, it's just, and you, and you had a great run there until you guys sold to Morgan Stanley. Can you tell us a little bit that, what that experience was like? Sure. So let me just go right back to Natixis. Uh, you know, so Natixis, as we know it today, is a multi-boutique firm, right? So a lot of different brands. At the time, Natixis had just purchased the asset management firm when I joined in 2001. And why that's important is that it was very similar. It was owned by MetLife. 84% of our fund business was from MetLife agents at Natixis when I was there. So the strategy there was to get back to top advisors. If we're selling mutual funds and investment products, it probably wasn't at MetLife in that time. So we only, we're gonna pay the wholesalers on six firms. We decided what six firms are the leaders. And with John's help, we turned the whole firm to go focus on a place where we weren't even doing business. And so our products, the way we had our sales team structure changed throughout that. And how that led to Eaton Vance uh, we had purchased a company called Active Index Advisors at Natixis, which is a direct indexing company. Our biggest competitor was Parametric. Parametric is owned by Eaton Vance. So what ended up happening was the head of distribution was no longer at Eaton Vance. I applied for the job, ended up getting the job. But I felt there were a lot of gems within Eaton Vance that literally just needed some attention that I thought we could grow. And that's great. If we focus back on your principles, what were... And you talked about it already, but give me some of your principles through your time at Eaton Vance that helped grow the firm. Well, a big one that uh, I, there are really two that I go by is uh, what type of client do you want? What type of client can, should we have? Can we have? And so uh, if I go back to 2007, Eaton Vance was the leader in closed end funds, you know, commission traded closed end funds. We had just come off the largest closed end fund in history in 2007 for the New York Stock Exchange. That's a different type of advisor than really who would use parametric, which is direct indexing, tax related. So really changing the firm and the structure of the firm to get focused on taxes, to get focused on top advisors that deal with the wealthiest clients. And as you know, the top advisors survive down markets. They actually usually gain more market share. Advisors usually that aren't top advisors that are maybe doing more transaction-oriented business don't survive bear markets long. 
And I think that the real key there was taking all these great products at Eaton Vance that could serve the top advisors and convincing the sales team, we're going to go serve the, the best advisors in the industry. Let's talk about how we're going to get there. Gotcha. We, we call that focus what matters most, right? I mean, you established, a, and it was only six firms that you focused on to start? That was six firms there. At, at, right. It was even smaller at uh, Eaton Vance. Really? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there were... I mean, you have to remember, we're really going from a closed-end fund, which was largely wirehouse-driven. Well, direct indexing and parametric group in the REA channel. Then it was the private wealth offices. Then it was the private banks. And now you're starting to see it become more mainstream. But we definitely defined, you know, it was, I think for us was what is a top advisor and being clear and making sure it was included in wholesalers' business plans, call reports, what they were focused on with all their activity. I mentioned sales capacity. Right. If you really look at your capacity, how are you using it? And good salespeople find their way to, to agree. It's like, yeah, I could probably be spending my time in more uh, fruitful places. You know, it's so fascinating, Matt, just speaking with you, because when you think about the concept of, you know, you can see in a lot of different ways, we call it, you know, focus what matters most, focus what you can control. It seems like the way you think around basically building a business and growing a business are those key factors, right? And then sort of ignoring everything else and your your whole ambition, it seems even today at Morgan Stanley, Eaton Vance, Parametric, it's still that same approach across all the business lines. So could you walk us through to the acquisition by Morgan Stanley of Eaton Vance and obviously your, in, in your role within that? And then you were talking about offline, just the different product lines that you have to focus on. In March of 2021, Eaton Vance was purchased by Morgan Stanley Investment Management. It was announced in October the previous year. And with that, you know, at the time, uh, Eaton Vance collectively was $600 billion. And under the Eaton Vance brand, there's multiple brands. I mentioned Parametric. There's also Calvert. Uh, there's Atlanta Capital. So we had other brands. And so we were getting married with a much larger global brand in Morgan Stanley. But really one of that, the points of that too is, well, it's Morgan Stanley. So how are other advisors or other firms going to feel about that? And so what was really important to them is, are we going to have the same brands that we have today? Uh, is it going to cause brand friction? So thinking through those things really quickly, and Morgan Stanley was great about it. They totally understand having been a previous owner of Van Campen. So they'd been there before, right. right? And so for us, when we got there, what we didn't know was they have a huge alts business. So we were trying to really think about it in Vance before this acquisition by Morgan Stanley. We should really be bigger in the alts business. We we're looking at private credit, private equity, and guess what? Emsim had it all. Then it became, well, how are we going to distribute all these products? And so I think what separates us some, somewhat from our competitors this way is we remain channelized. And what does channelized mean? Well, we have a wirehouse channel, so it's just calling on the wirehouse advisors. We have an independent channel. It also calls on the independent dealers, but also banks. And then we have an REA channel, right? So right. those three channels, if I were to look at the sales mixes, those three channels are completely different. We basically have three different sales meetings, three different comp plans, three different sets of everything because the clients and what they buy in those channels is largely different. And when you look at your competition, not, not everybody makes those strategic decisions. And it, it can be hard sometimes to sell across channels. And you have that channel conflict. Is that what you're kind of getting at? Uh, we don't see as much channel conflict. I think what we have is probably product conflict. Meaning gotcha. I walk into a, a, a wirehouse, I might have only 10 of my products available there. I go to the RAAs, I have my entire suite of products available there. I go to the independent channel, maybe alts in separately managed accounts aren't as popular as mutual funds, right? So right. you start thinking of structures and what products are available to the advisors in those channels really can drive your strategy. Yeah, because I've always felt pro uh, product structure drives channel focus, right? Mutual That's funds, true. right? Mutual yeah, funds, so. RAs, and then um, you know, LPs, right? RA sum. Right, there's some LP power users, yeah. but much smaller market share, separate accounts a little bit, but then you find your your way. So let, let's talk a little bit about, because um, this ties into your sales process and your team. Could you just walk us through how you think about sales process and keeping the team focused? I mean, you just addressed it right there in the three different. Is there anything you would, would want to add to that? 
Yeah, well, I think the key is is the the top advisors and how they're defined and, and making sure we all agree what those are, right? Right. Um, it isn't your your best friend that you're, is an advisor. That might be parts of some of the ways of getting there. So I think also is what type of products these advisors use, right? Yeah. Some m- might not use mutual funds to a large degree. Some might not be able to use separate accounts. Some maybe are just beginning the alts journey. And are you showing up? early where they're trying to transition their business, that's a ripe opportunity. So you could easily be mistaken. Well, they don't have a lot of alts now. So if you ask the wrong questions, you could also fall off track, right? Because someone's just beginning to do that. So we spend a lot of time making sure that, you know, there's, there's a handful of advisors we're focused on Then What about the others? How do you reach all the other clients that are doing business with you? And so we are very disciplined in segmentation, but also customization. And what I mean by that is, we let wholesalers decide how we're going to market with each division or each segment. So you could run a a campaign yourself on advisors that care about taxes. You might have another group of advisors that care about alts. You might market something to a specific firm. Well, guess what? We've created a program where you can pick what you want to market in your territory. So you could, as a salesperson here, you could run five different marketing campaigns in your territory that are completely different. Wow. That's, I mean, fascinating. Again, not surprised the success you've had. Walk us through your communication cadence and we'll start just how do, how do you communicate with the different teams, if you will, sales teams? I want to get to the second part, which is managing up. How do you communicate up? But let's first kind of think managing down. What is the communication process of how, whether it's a weekly meetings, do you have team meetings? Is it big all company? Each channel does their own meeting. Right. Okay. So, so it's, and that's really important because they have different products or different things they want to cover, or there's different opportunities in each channel, or, or, or there could be a new product launching in a separate firm that's in your channel. Right. So that's, it's, it's highly customized. Okay. For me, it's really, I think the principles of top advisors, multiple products, they, they know those things. The other thing that I always use is, is, you know, we have to get perfect what's in our control. Right. So that's that. all the follow up. That's all, you know, the sending out of things. That's, that's making sure, like, even operational issues, anything that comes up, we can fix that, right? Because the market and your performance can take away so much opportunity. But if you can control it, we have to make that perfect because that increases my odds of success over time. And so, you know, we want to know what's broken. We want to know what's not working. So we go through lists of, and I think this is really important, our sales team knows that they can call me, they can call other managers and, and just say, hey, this is broken. It's not working. And our, our job is not to say, I don't want to hear it. Our job is, let me fix it for you so right. you can do a better job. And so I think they are so comfortable communicating that way with us that actually thinks it makes us a much better company. Wow. I love that. So because your, your job then is really to enable your teammates right, to be successful. Yeah, I love, I love, you know, you, there's nothing better than seeing, uh, you know, I've been at Eaton Vance for 17 years, seeing someone come off into the desk, learn the products, know they deserve that job, that promotion, and then they just go crush it because they already have so much of the DNA. Your segmentation, which I love, right, makes all the sense in the world because it, it, it's been very hard for our sales team, who's a long only mutual fund separate account sales team really make it over to into raising money for private equity. Everything, it's, the, it's, it's not so much the strategy that's different, it's the wholesale, it's the, you get paid two points, you get paid out over three years, other things recurring revenue, right? So I really, the, 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 the segmentation really resonates with me. And also I, I love when you talk about, you gotta get perfect on what you can control. Yeah, it has to be perfect. Right? So, uh, you know, it's, well, in fairness, I, I have to mention a few other groups we yeah, have, you know, please. so so we have a lot of products, right? We have multiple brands. You know, the last thing you want is, is I'll, I'll call it advisor conflict. And what is advisor conflict is when if you have multiple salespeople competing for the same dollar and you're at the same company, it's not a healthy relationship with the advisor or the sales team. So we have what we call well strategies group. They, they work with the wholesaler, but they largely support and service the advisors for wholesalers. So let me give you an example. Uh, we are very popular with muni laddered portfolios, highly customized. We can customize any product for your client. 
Well, with that comes a lot of, you know, just a lot of work on the advisor's half and our half. And we take in a lot of securities. You know, I, I think 70% of our accounts are funded with securities in kind. So there's tax consequences if we sell something or don't sell something. Imagine a wholesaler getting a really complex case that could take a couple hours or three hours to resolve. Now you, I've taken away your effectiveness to, to really go sell that. What they need is someone to go take that that they trust and figure that out. So our wealth strategies group, anything tax related, anything that can, can be in-kind transitioned, they have a partner they call on that they bring into meetings and they trust that this wealth strategies person is going to go in and give great service to their financial advisor. So, you know, that's one thing. The alts thing, we also have a similar group because as you know, onboarding alts is not easy, right? right? I mean, paperwork to getting it, uh, really getting it back on time and closings and capital calls. Imagine if you had one wholesaler dealing with tax transitions, onboarding of that, they would be consumed with, you know, they become highly ineffective. Right. So we have an alts team that sells to advisors that mainly do alts, but we also have the generalists that go out and say, hey, you know, uh, I can go out and talk about alts. I can really tell the story. I'll give you a simple example is bank loans are a big franchise of ours. Go a little up the ladder, you're at private credit. Well, should I be in bank loans or should I be in private credit? We get that question a lot. Your sales team has to be able to answer that question. Either way, we are going to make sure that that happens the right way for the client. Right. And so not to go on heavily here, but I think I, I, it's really important to highlight these, these groups that work with a wholesaler because the biggest question I get, and this gets back to your upper management, is how are we going to sell the different brands, the different products to the different channels? effectively. Yeah. And what is, and, and so your answer is still back to segmentation, if I'm following this correctly? Segmentation. Yeah. And then it's the things in our control. So when you think about service, right. But you know, think about selling versus service. Sure. They're one in the same, right? If we, if, and so the, the service component is very important to me because we only have so much service capacity. We only have so many people that can go around and, and handle these types of accounts. We'll do 18,000 transitions this year so far. 18,000 portfolios we've looked at and had to think about. Oh my gosh. So, you know, when you think about that, you want to get it right, but you also want to make sure that an advisor has questions, that they feel confident to go back to the client and explain what's going on. So what, what a competitive advantage over the years at Eaton Vance building out this infrastructure right, to support that. Yeah, you know what it was? The wholesaler said, man, I'm spending too much time trying to figure <laughs> out operations and what to do with this account. And so he said, well, that, you know, we kept hearing it. So that's how the Wealth Strategies Group really came into being to try to help them figure out how they handle that. I never considered, because I was always just a salesperson until five years ago, product development. So I never knew after, it's about six months ago, I, I woke up and we did our database business. I didn't know the number of demos that you do is a direct correlation to product quality. So what you just went through it, there was a similar correlation, right? You're, they're pitching a product. They're, tie, they're tied up to an administrative work. You can't do this. Well, that's feedback. Okay, we'll put this in place. Now you improve the product quality, right? You, you fill the holes no different than us. We have done seven, 8,000 demos, right? Wow. The early days, 100 demos, 100. feedback. Okay, hey, we need this. In order for them to buy, they need this. Okay, they need, right? Then I'll send the product. You know, and as we can rapidly iterate, all of a sudden it starts to build, and then you realize the demos have built your product because you've just listened. Yep. Right? You know, <laughs> you, you, good ideas uh, find their way into our business. You know, I'll tell you one that, that you'll laugh, but any salesperson listening to this will, will get a chuckle, is that, you know, you really become a connoisseur of fast food when you travel, right? <laughs> like, and so, you know, uh, I personally like Chick-fil-A. So I knew more about my chicken sandwich being ready when I could pick it up <laughs> than some of the bigger investments that an investor might make. And so one of the things we did was, if you're gonna open up a bond portfolio with us, a lot of questions we would get is, hey, did the cash show up? Is the paperwork there? So you think of the Chick-fil-A app, we have an automatic messaging that tells you we got the paperwork, your portfolio is 30% invested, 50% invested. So guess what that does? That cuts down the calls but it makes the wholesale, they can follow the transition of the account and the paperwork. That idea came from wholesalers saying, calling up saying, I don't know where it is and seeing, well, if you can get this on your fast food, how can we build something very similar to give that type of service? And so that's just an example of 
But that's, now, that's insane sustainable competitive advantage because mm -hmm. you've been to have to figure, you've had to figure all this out, but you've been great listeners. And then you react. I always say, it's like, can you, you, some people can listen and not react, but can you listen and then actually react and solve those problems? Yeah, you know, and I would, I, you know, keys to the investment team, like they were totally like, yeah, this is cool. This would make sense. This would help because they would cut down their call volumes, right? right? So, and the, so the whole food the, chain, yeah. not to use food again here, yeah, yeah. but you know, you can understand, yeah, that makes sense. Why wouldn't we do that? And what a great experience for the advisor. Now they're kept in the loop on a much more rapid, they don't have to ask that information exactly. pushed to them, right? Yep. That's great. So with that in mind, with the communication in mind with that, Let's transition to my, one of my favorite topics where I think it's the few leverage points a salesperson has, CRM. Could you just talk a little about your experience over the course of time, your value of a CRM and the value to the organization um, and how that's impacted you know, your scale? Yeah, so when you, when you think of a CRM, you think about just call reports, right? And uh, I, think, I think that's important, but it's not really the way I think of a CRM. I think of a CRM as a total client experience, right? So uh, if, whether it's a separately managed account, whether it's an all, if we're doing anything on your, if you have a, you know, your account, you have a question, we're doing something for that account, you're an advisor, you call us, that has to be in the CRM, right? Because right. you're going to go say, well, who'd you talk to? Well, well we, we need to record everything. So we're building a new CRM that can incorporate all these features. But I also like the, in a CRM is aside from doing smart segmentation, as I mentioned, we can do like auto enrollment on distributing fact sheets, investment updates. If you click through on webinars, to me, the CRM is, is just going to be pure magic uh, when it's fully going from, from service. And I like to say the client experience, you know. Uh, so if we have mutual funds, we have ETFs, we have separately managed accounts, we have alts, we have all different brands. I right. need to know what that client experience is going to be for that advisor. If they use all these different products, what's going, what's going to be in that CRM is all those different brands and products and what's happening in terms of sending information out, uh, not just activity that we have, right. but did they attend a due diligence meeting? You know, did they click on the webinar? So I think it's going to be something, I think the industry overall is behind, but because we're building a new one, I see it as really the central force of making us, I always say, I want to get more effective and efficient before we add more people. Because I feel like no salesperson that I know is like, oh, we cut my territory. I spend the last 10 years growing it, yeah. growing it. And so I think, well, how effective and efficient can I get that advisor and wholesaler's relationship to work? Yeah. And I think so, that's key with CRM. Well, you just brought up an incredible business point that I learned in this whole process of this database, which is just adding bodies to an inefficient process is a really bad business, right? <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people want to do that though. That's the thing, you know, a lot of people want to do that. That's true. Okay, so a lot of the listeners to this podcast, when they think CRM, they think logging the meetings you've done and simply uh, logging the call notes. I think it's so important to log the meetings so you can look at your past activity and you can quickly follow up. You can see where you are, you see all your footprints. And then if that person leaves that you don't want, you know where they've been. I call them gold bars, right? So obviously just, could you maybe t like, Obviously, you're a massive believer in a CRM because it it's the central of everything you're talking about. So you're a big believer. Could you ever imagine not having a CRM as a sales organization raising money? No. I mean, I, I think now a lot of us have data packs, right? We go out and invest in data that the broker dealers provide us so we can become more effective and efficient in our job. Right. That's an, a huge waste of money unless you're going to tie it into an effective system that people can use. And so... I think I'm real excited about where we're going with it. But right now, I think it's like, I because I don't have a great system, I just know how much better it's going to be. Gotcha. And so, you know, th this is the last place where people want to make investments, generally speaking, but it really has to be one of the first. I couldn't agree more. The reason I bring that up is a lot of people in our industry can, I mean, we have almost 900 investment firms and 3,600 individuals, and I've talked to so many different people. And they just, they just don't embrace it, right, the way that I believe they can and should to get leverage, right? So you're, you're like in a whole different stratosphere of how you're thinking about it, but just even at the basics, basically the bottom line is a CRM's everything for a salesperson in terms of helping them manage their business. Yeah, especially as you have like the specialist, right? Right. If someone else is touching that advisor outside of you, you wanna be in the loop. Like that's what you're stressed about as a salesperson. You, wanna, you, you spent years coddling this relationship 
for someone to come in and potentially destroy it. You want to make sure like, no, you need to get back to that person. I want to make sure you're on these issues. And so I actually think that a good CRM keeps everyone connected on how the relationship's going with the client. Love that. Okay, I want to transition just for a sec into your personal sales leadership style. So how, how much you <laughs> characterize, you know, because I, as I said in the pre-call notes, like I have such admiration for it. You take such a common sense view of business and it's just, it's like top advisors, more products, top advisors. I mean, I, I love that, right? Because it's, it's simple, but it's impactful. It's the strategy. Just for how you treat people, you know, over the course of time, your leadership style in that way, could you just, how, how would you characterize it? And what have you seen that like has really worked best over the years? I'm lucky. I've had really, you know, my success is really all the people that have worked with me. And I say that we've, we've been able to have minimal turnover with the sales force and managers that have worked with me. I think the one thing that they, I'll go to the negative first. Yeah. You have way too many ideas, Matt. You got to slow down. <laughs> and I think that's fair. Uh, but, you know, I like to co-create with the managers. Like, this is what I'm thinking. What are you thinking? This is what I'm saying. What are you saying? And, uh, you know, I think we might need more process around that. How would you think about that? And so, Everything that we've done has been co-created with other people. And it makes it so much easier because everyone's part of the success. Or even if it doesn't work out, we could say, yeah, we all gave it a shot. So collaborative, like you're big I, into the collaboration. I, I think I socialize a lot, maybe over-socialize. Maybe be, I'm probably over-inclusive. Um, we wanted to get other people's opinions. Opinions. Yeah. Uh, I think they, you know, at the end of the day, they want to work with someone that cares about them. And one thing I've learned about this business is like uh, life is not a straight line, you know? And so you have to be there for your team when maybe it's personal, maybe it's professional, they're going through something and you recognize, hey, it's okay. You're super talented, you know, just, it's like any professional athlete doesn't always go out and perform an A plus in every game they do. Great sales and marketing teams are no different, right? So let's right. figure out how we're going to get out of it. That's great. So dovetails perfectly into my next question, which, uh -oh. yeah, what would you, for young salespeople coming into our industry, what advice would you give them? You know, my advice, uh, I've had a different background between retail and institutional, different types of firms. I would say that uh, you have to be curious. I wish I was this curious when I went to college because I went, nearly didn't have the curiosity to learn yeah. or compete. When I got into work, it was a lot of fun. And, you, and so I would tell a young person, I tell all, all, all professionals, my door is open. You can send me an email, you can call me, you can come in anytime you want. That's kind of a test, right? <laughs> Whether they'll take you up on yeah. it. Yeah, and there's no, there shouldn't be an org chart that says, what do you mean, I, I, I don't report to Matt, I can't go see Matt. You can come see me anytime. The other thing is, anytime you bring a problem to me, I want you to tell me how we're gonna fix it. Love right. That. So yeah. if, if you're young and you're thinking about like, this isn't working well, you know, you probably know more than anyone else what's not working. And guess what? Someone like me probably has no idea that it's broken and how we're going to fix it, but you do. And so that's what I'm looking for in any young professional is, is to, to help us get better. Well, that's, a, I mean, that's brilliant. The thing that I've always espoused as a leader very along the same lines is when basically taking every excuse you can possibly take away. If somebody needs something, I get it to them, right? It's never, you're never gonna point to me and say, the reason I can't get this done is key. You've, it's like, you're, you're <laughs> in my way, right? Because you feel like a lot of times what you've done as a leader, to, uh, it removes all the obstacles yeah. for their team, right? So the team can be successful. That's really, to me at the end of the day, that's one of the biggest jobs of a leader is just remove obstacles, especially both human beings, right? There might oh, be yeah. another in front of other human beings, right? To, but the fact that you have an open door policy for anyone, speaks volumes about your, your leadership. Well, thanks. I, you know, it's, but the best ideas we've gotten have come from the people that have brought them to me. Yeah. Literally. Well, I love that. So to wrap up, mm -hmm. uh, everybody, it's the world's challenging for everyone, right? Right now, what challenges are you facing, right? In the distribution world? And then what are you doing to overcome those challenges? You know, there's a lot going on in the, in the distribution or investment world, right? There, we all read the same documents and studies and research. Um, I think about a very simple thing. What is it that's going to get my salesperson a meeting? What's going to keep them relevant and what's going to keep them different from their competitors? Because I think the hardest thing is, is getting a meeting, getting someone to answer that email or call and actually going to tell them this great story you want to tell. So I have to think about, you know, if my 
team is out there trying to get to the top advisors. What do the top advisors need and what am I going to create? Whether it's a, a learning experience about something like taxes or alts, whether it's creating a new product. Um, but I think that's, you know, I, I think any great salesperson will tell you that they want to remain relevant with the top advisors, right? And sometimes, sometimes I, and people will laugh, but sometimes, you know, your products catch a cold. They catch the flu. Sometimes <laughs> they go in the hospital. They don't come out of the hospital. And, you know, That's so well you don't said. always, you're not always healthy, you know? Right. And, and you're, and so for an event, for a salesperson, they have to, they can't disappear when our products catch a cold, but they still have to be relevant and add value. Let's say if we, a strategy is out of favor and the advisor's sitting there, right? What are you going to talk to the advisor about? I saw you last quarter. I need to create things that are going to keep that salesperson relevant. And I think that's why I think I can retain salespeople culturally and everything else because yeah. they know that that's really important to me. There's a theme that I use which says, you know, help other people get what they want out of life, right? You're a supplier, right? And in in it feels like a military term, right? You're supplying the troops with everything they possibly need to win in the field. And that's so well said. <laughs> well, Matt, this has been awesome. It's what a, what a great way to conclude because that's really what life's about, right? If you can help other people get what they want out of life, right, you can have a rich life. I mean, it's really pretty special. So, well, thank you, Guy. And, you know, thanks for your help too. Uh, Dakota's been really helpful uh, educating a lot of people on my team. So, thank you. You're welcome. Well, this has been such a thrill, everyone. Matt Rikos, Eaton Vance, unbelievable. And thank you everyone for joining the Rainmaker podcast. Another unbelievable interview here with Matt Whitcoast. We can't wait to see you on the next Rainmaker podcast. You can find this episode and others on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. If you would like to check up on past episodes, check out our website, dakota.com. Finally, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. We welcome all your feedback as well. Thank you for investing your time with Dakota. Hey, thanks so much for joining Rainmaker Podcast. Hope you enjoyed the show, enjoyed the interview. I know I loved it. And hey, if you wake up in the morning and you raise money for an investment firm, you do cold outreach, whether you're a sales leader or salesperson, and you don't know about Dakota Marketplace, we would love to show it to you. It's world-class, it's used by over 880 investment firms and over 3,600 individual salespeople. To learn more, go to dakota.com and click on a free trial.